So firstly, uh, we will reserve plenty of time for Q&A. In the slides, there'll be a little tutorial on how to ask a question. Ah, oh, there it is. So the little Q&A button there. But uh, we also love it when you raise your hand because that means you can ask a question live uh, and you can try to stump Ari with all your ad tech questions. Uh, so we will prioritize those who want to ask their questions live. Uh, but today we'll be talking about Cookie Apocalypse 2, the future of digital identity. This is the second in a series. Those of you who joined us in February, um, thank you for joining us then. This will be the continuation of that. Uh, and for everyone who attends, uh, we will send a copy of our new white paper to everyone here. Uh, that will lay out in some detail some of the topics that Ari will cover today. And so you can go ahead and look at that and get those solutions and start to implement them. All uh, right, so without any further ado, I'm going to introduce Ari Faparo. He is my boss. He is a recognized product leader in ad tech and SaaS, served as VP at DoubleClick, director of product management at Google, yada, 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 invented the VAST standard. He knows all things ad tech, and you can follow him on Twitter. He tweets a lot at Ari Papp. So without any further ado, I will turn the microphone over to Ari, and let's get started. Great. Thanks, Paul, for that great introduction, and thank you all for attending. Um, so what we're going to go over today is the current state of identity and then uh, some deep dives on various identity use cases. Um, we, as a follow-up to the last cookie webinar, um, last time we, we did sort of an emergency webinar a week after the Chrome announcement um, that was really sort of a, a quick overview of all the things we knew and didn't know at the time and a lot of Q&A. Um, as follow-up, it's now been, I don't know, six weeks since that, la since that uh, time. Uh, this is hopefully going to be more practical advice around different forms of identity and how they're being used and how they might be used. Um, in, uh, in different ad tech use cases. Um, so um, as Paul mentioned, we have a white paper that also has almost all of the same information uh, as well as very specific details about how our company Beeswax handles this uh, and that will be sent by email to the, your attendee. Um, so let's start with the current state of identity. Let's talk about what, uh, where we've come from, where we're going and what's available right now. Um, so, like looking back traditionally at the history of media, uh, I don't think this will be new information to folks, but um, but you could kind of think of the world of media before the digital uh, revolution as being sort of this this bifurcation between high reach, low resolution media. So TV, print, and radio; these are all mass media, great ways to reach large groups of consumers, um, but it was not uh, individualized. There was there was a lack of identity in these channels. Um, and that, that meant that measurement was based on sort of broad cohorts of data like Nielsen ratings or other sort of uh, ratings and, uh, and cohorts of users or geography uh, as ways of measuring the, um, the attribution of your ads to results. Uh, there's also a lot of waste because if you're buying ads on a television program, a good portion of the people who are exposed were not in your, in your target group. Uh, and that was accepted because that was the price of reach. Um, on the other hand, you had uh, low reach but high resolution media like direct response marketing uh, and then later email marketing. Um, and this was uh, incredibly powerful because you could use data overlays to identify the users and to figure out who they were and to give them um, messages that were specific to your product. But the obvious challenges, which is it's not very sexy, you're talking about mail and other forms like that. Uh, there was no sight, sound, and motion, et cetera. So this history lesson kind of goes into, you know, the early uh, era of digital, uh, where we were looking at uh, this incredible promise, which was the right ad to the right person at the right time. And that effectively, the, the promise was that we would get them both at scale. We'd be able to do direct response or direct response like techniques for branding at, at scale, right? That's where we all grew up in, and that's what, motivated so much investment and time in this digital revolution that's now the um, you know the second largest form of media in most markets uh, after TV. But without um, identity a lot of this breaks down because one to one of scale requires identity. Uh, implicit in right ad, right person, right time is data uh, and identity. So you can write ad as reliant on understanding who the people are and what their preferences are. The right person obviously is demographic and the right time intent. So without identity and without, you're, you're breaking down what uh, is underlying the promise of digital. Um, so I would postulate and motivate 
that the erosion of identity in digital is sort of the defining trend. Uh, we, we've come 20 years of digital incredible growth uh, throughout the, the Western world. And, uh, and now we're at a turning point where the underlying assumptions are going away or eroding. We have to figure out what the next era of digital requires. Um, so now I'm going to go into some specifics. So let's talk about what's the current state of identity by channel. And, and a little caveat before I jump in here. The subject of this uh, webinar is identity. So we're talking about how do you identify users and use them for various forms. I'm not going to cover the Chrome sandbox or differential privacy in this conversation. Um, they, it's not that I don't want to, it's that it's just not the subject I'm looking at. I'm looking at right now, how do we identify users and what do we do with that data? Um, things can change, things will change. Um, so, so to start with, like by media, the, the state of identity is quite different. Um, and I won't, I'm not gonna read all the words on all these slides, but uh, I'll just kind of quickly blow through some things, which is obviously the web browser, either desktop or in app has, uh, has, you know, currently estimates about 60% coverage where we can have third party cookies. Um, and as we know, and uh, Chrome has announced that that 60% is going to go away. So the future looks pretty grim for identity on the web browser. Um, in app is um, great right now and because maids, mobile identifiers, IDFAs, et cetera, are uh, fully available in app. Um, but we expect, I think most people expect them to be restricted by Apple and Google in the coming years. We don't know, but we know that Apple and Google are both gatekeepers here and they both have strong positions on privacy. So the betting money would be that in-app is, go, is going to go the way of browser. Um, connected TV, and I have some data on, I think the next slide about this, um, is a messy identity space with multiple different challenges and multiple different companies controlling identity. Um, and, uh, and this is a bit of a US centric point of view because connected TV is sort of taking off in the US and, and not as much in Europe. Um, but it, it's a very exciting area of advertising that's very challenged on the identity side. And for the sake of completeness, digital out of home, obviously there's no identity. You don't know who's walking past your billboard. Uh, and, pod, and podcasts, um, it would be great to know who is listening to your podcast, who's seeing podcast ads, uh, but it, there's another gatekeeper problem here. And it's unlikely that you know, we're going to get good identity um, within the podcast advertising space. So, so if you think about it holistically in terms of digital, it's a real mess. Like the, the problem of identity is quite significant uh, right now and it's not gonna get better. Um, so I pulled up some data, non-scientific data. We just asked our analysts to look at what was going through beeswax in Q1 of this year. Um, so on connected TV, which is the fastest growing area of digital advertising in the US, um, the, um, the ID space is very fragmented. And the number one source of ID, uh, the number one type of ID we see is a synthetic ID created by the exchange or the SSP. So what this means is that there is no reliable device ID um, being passed. Instead, the SSP is effectively creating some sort of hash that uh, of the, let's say the IP address and the publisher of the, of the auction request and is sending that through as a ID that a DSP like Beeswax can use for frequency capping and maybe some additional forms, but it's not really bridgeable to external data sets or to attribution. Um, so this, this is a real big difference from let's say mobile where in app you have the vast majority of IDs are device IDs. So it's inter it, this is just a data point that I thought people would think was interesting. Um, another data point I looked at is IP address. So, um, so IP address is um, a source of identity that is um, very useful in some circumstances, but that has some baggage on the privacy side uh, where some, um, it, some um, jurisdictions and some uh, privacy uh, rules consider personal data. Other, some companies don't consider personal data. Some geographies like the US, it's not always considered personal data. But what's interesting here is that a third of the IP addresses that come through beeswax on auctions are truncated, meaning the final octet of the IP is removed. Uh, so it's less personally identifiable and therefore is less useful for any sort of, sort of identity. Um, interesting data. I thought the number was gonna be higher actually in terms of truncated, but um, this number, um, kind of was the first time I've seen the data pulled in this way. 
so um, these two examples giving some um, some uh, more justification to the question of how messy the ID space is. So now let's look at what are the sources of identity in digital and uh, and kind of going through this um, and talking about sort of the pros and cons. And once again, I'm not going to read everything on the slide. I just want to kind of highlight what as a practitioner in programmatic you or I have to deal with or DSPs or platforms. You know, it, it's, it varies who's going to do the work, but in, an, in a world with um, fragmented and eroding identity, the work has to be done. Um, so, so going down the list, uh, third-party cookies that we're all very familiar with. They work great for simple use cases. It, when they're there, everyone loves them, uh, but they're going away. And, uh, and noteworthy is that they represent a device, not a person. Um, so a single human being could have five or six different uh, devices, which have different forms of identity. Uh, and third-party cookies are going to be only a tiny slice. Um, mobile identifiers, I think we already talked about, which is they're persistent, they work great for in-app activities, um, but they're also probably going away. They're also just a device. Um, and opt-out, it, you know, it's possible to opt-out on your phone, but probably 1% of the consumers know how to do it. Um, so first-party cookies, an area where there's a lot of activity, a lot of, uh, a lot of entrepreneurial startups working on this. Um, how to use first party cookies? Well, they're persistent. That's great. They're not blocked. That's great. That you can link them to first party profiles if, you, if you're a publisher, let's say. That's great. Uh, but as soon as you start trying to use them as an advertiser across sites, you have a problem because they're first party. They don't work across sites. So there has to be bridging mechanisms for making them work across sites. Uh, and that's where I think a lot of the entrepreneurial activity is taking place, um, different methods to bridge them. Um, so in the news over the last several years, there have been various forms of consortia. So I kind of separated them into shared identity consortia, where uh, everyone uses the same cookie or everyone uses the same ID, uh, and shared first party consortia, where everyone uses the same login, like a shared login. Um, and they both have positives and negatives. The shared identity consortia um, is, has an immediate positive, which is reduces the need for syncing and makes the third party cookie ecosystem work a lot better. Uh, but the problem is that they're still reliant on third party cookies to some extent. So if you have the same ID across a bunch of DSPs and SSPs that, you know, it's great. It will, it will improve match rates in the short term, but it's not a solution to the third party cookie going away. Um, login consortium, on the other hand, uh, where you have a bunch of publishers sharing the same login, that works great within the consortia. So that's effectively taking first party identity and sharing it across publishers. Um, but you have the same problem that first party cookies do, which is how do you bridge that data over to the advertiser side? So it's great that a bunch of publishers like in Germany are sharing logins and they all have this similar data. But if you're a buyer, a DSP, you have a question about how do you use that data because you, it doesn't match your site and your data. Um, and then um, continuing on this, like you have other forms of identity and, and these are not mutually exclusive. So these are often used in conjunction with one another. Um, probabilistic and deterministic graphs. So probabilistic graph is basically taking a bunch of IDs of, of different kinds and stitching them together based on some, uh, some statistical method. Um, it's very flexible, very easy to use. Um, but in many cases, it's still dependent on third party cookies or some other ID to use them. When, when an actual auction has to be identified, there has to be something to look up that primary key against. So, so while probabilistic graphs are very useful, they're as a form of pure identity, they really need to be combined with something else. Um, deterministic graphs, however, uh, are being built on top of first party cookies. And the idea being that we have someone's real email, real phone number, et cetera. This is where a lot of, uh, a lot of investment is taking place. Uh, but uh, they they sometimes have the same problem, which is they have to be linked to other identities. So they're not a standalone solution in some cases. Um, and then the last two, uh, IP addresses and fingerprinting. So I talked earlier about IP addresses. They're persistent um, across devices in a household. So the, the trick is that it's not a user, it's a household or a business. And, and there are privacy questions. It's difficult for a end user to opt out of an IP address. Um, and so there are some real pluses and minuses, and IP addresses tend to be used as sort of an ingredient to other um, identity uh, processes rather than a standalone. 
um, and they're used quite a bit for for advertising that is uh, intended to be at the household or business level as opposed to the individual level. Um, and then finally, fingerprinting, which is here mostly for the sake of completeness. Um, the idea being using whatever data is available on the auction or the bid request to try to statistically identify the user. This is considered uh, the worst of the privacy friendly way of doing it. Um, and I think that um, most, most companies out there uh, would shy away from fingerprinting in any form, um, or at least would deny they're doing it, even if they are doing it in some form. Um, so we're probably not going to talk about fingerprinting again in this presentation. I just wanted to put it there for completeness. So, um, so I know I've been talking a lot, and there's a lot, of, a lot on these slides. But I think what's important is that what we're going to do in the rest of this presentation is look at these last two slides: the various forms of identity, cookies, identifiers, consortia, graphs, IP addresses, and say how do those work in the real world? How do we, how do we actually use those in some realistic use cases? And, and what are the pros and cons here? So let's go to it. So what we're going to now do is go through some practical examples um, and, uh, and, and talk about what works and what doesn't work. Um, so how is identity used? Let's start there. So if we want to broadly talk about identity, there's four uses of, of identity in digital, uh, frequency management, targeting, first and third party targeting, Optimization, meaning how much should I pay for this user? How should I score this user? Uh, and attribution and reporting. Uh, you could probably nitpick and say there are other uses, but these four really kind of cover most of the things that a DSP or an ad server use identity for. So, um, so we're going to go through each of these four and talk about pros and cons of different methods and deep dive on, on some of the techniques involved. Okay. So, when you when you pivot effectively the method of I, the identity source on the left column with each of these four um, ways of using the identity, uh, you can get a vision for how, what is possible. Um, so, what is interesting is that third-party cookies, maids, IP addresses, uh, and the shared IDs they're all really useful. Like that's why we've built digital tools to use third party cookies because they, they work really well with the caveats we talked about earlier. So when a third party cookie is available, it's great for frequency capping, great for targeting, great for bidding, great for attribution with the caveat that it's a device, not a person, uh, with the caveat that you can delete it with the caveat, caveats, caveats, caveats. So you, you get the idea. But this is why um, the industry has grown up this way because some of these forms of identities are quite useful. Um, and then other, uh, the other identity sources, like first party cookies, graphs, et cetera, they're useful in some contexts. So um, for example, uh, first party cookies, uh, this is publisher side cookies. Well, they're great if you're frequency capping on a publisher site. So if a publisher, for example, passes their first party identity to their ad server and uses that for frequency capping, it works great. It just doesn't work as well when you go across publishers. Um, same with targeting. Same with bidding. Um, and then deterministic graphs, for example, work great for all four of these use cases, but they tend to have very limited reach because um, not all users can be identified deterministically. So there are trade-offs. That's, that's going to be kind of the main takeaway from this entire presentation, which is there's a lots of forms of identity and there are lots of trade-offs for each. All right. So let's first talk about frequency capping. Um, so controlling frequency does not need to be perfect, and it isn't perfect. If we, even if we had perfect identity on every auction, frequency cap would still not be perfect because the just the um, the mechanics of reading and writing frequency so quickly make it sort of a best effort type of technology. No, no DSP can frequently can frequency cap perfectly. With that said. Um, what you're trying to do, sort of like the COVID, is, is, is bend the curve. You're trying to avoid the spikes of frequency. You don't want to serve thousands of ads to one per person. You want to create the average curve to be, uh, to be optimal so that your ads resonate the most with the largest reach. Um, so um, when you think about identity as it relates to frequency capping, and this is very under the covers, this is what DSPs and ad servers do. It's probably not what individual customers care about, but it's important to think about. Is um, is use different forms of identity. So the 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 traditional forms, third party cookies and maids, work great. 
for frequency cap. Um, probabilistic and deterministic graphs also work pretty well for frequency caps because um, once again, it's a it's an ingredient. Doesn't need to be perfect. Doesn't need to have 100% reach to use a probabilistic graph when you have it for frequency capping. Um, first party cookies and and um, and shared login stuff. Well, that works great on a per publisher basis. And and I'll just I'll just also come back to the graph I showed a couple slides ago about connected TV. 75 whatever percent of auctions on, in connected TV have a publisher SSP uh, synthesized ID. And you can use that for frequency gap on a per publisher basis. You just can't use it across sites. You can't use it across uh, exchanges, right? So there are trade-offs here. Uh, and then IP address, which is actually pretty commonly used by DSPs for frequency capping. It works at a household level, but not at a per person level um, and not, uh, not for the same device across, across, um, across instances. So, um, so there's, so some of the stuff works pretty well, some doesn't. And what is important, and I, I put here as a key takeaway, is platforms need to have fallback between methods. To give one example, let's say, let's say your platform only allows you to do maids or cookie IDs. Um, so you're doing maids and cookie IDs, uh, but the same user is on their phone and their laptop at home, doesn't work. You don't know those are two of the same person. On the other hand, if you only use IP address, the phone were and, and computer and desktop will work great when you're in your house. And then you grab your phone and you go to work. I know we don't go to work anymore, but trust, at some point we will. You go to work, connect to the Wi-Fi, you have a different IP address. The IP address frequency cap stop works. So, it's this, so what you need is probabilistic combinations of frequency capping. Um, and so this is sort of a, a quick example, which is uh, imagine you're a DSP or a bidder. And you get a request, request one, DSP cookie present. Great, put it in the database, we serve an ad. Then you get a second request and the DSP cookie is not there, but it has the same IP address as the first request. Should you serve an ad in that case? Should you frequency gap in that case? Don't know, it depends on the tech. Um, then you get a third request and this is a new cookie from that same DSP, uh, uh, but your probabilistic graph matches this user as the same household ID as the first one. Should you have a new ad served or not? Um, should, it, uh, should you pay a fee based on the use of that probabilistic graph or not? These are important questions that are all under the hood. Um, and you should talk to your vendors about what happens in these cases. You should walk through them. No vendor's perfect. This is not a commercial for beeswax by any means. This is the sort of things that are interesting if you want to control frequency, if you think it's important and identity is going away. Second use case, targeting. So first party and third party data targeting are dependent on identity. Uh, sure, we have contextual. I'm not going to talk about contextual. Contextual is great. Uh, we're talking about using identity for targeting, which is really commonly used in the digital marketplace right now and is probably uh, one of the most affected things by the loss of identity. So, so it's a little bit of a different story from frequency gap. So uh, once again, third party cookies work, but they're going away. Um, probabilistic and deterministic graphs are really important in this. So um, when the ID can be linked, when, um, using a graph to target a, uh, a segment is, you know, a, a pretty common technique in most platforms. And it, and it, uh, and it makes sense in the right context. Sometimes the buyer will, uh, will value it lower. So a, a, a complete, a exact match on a third party cookie or made might be higher value than a graph match. Um, but it's a big part of, of getting completeness around identity. Um, but we have to watch out because these graphs currently are very dependent on cookies or maids, which are going away. So, um, so using those graphs in the future is going to be dependent on making those graphs work with different forms of identity, like first party cookies. So, it, um, so that is kind of a, a work in progress. And unless the world moves to more first party data, you're going to have the usefulness of those graphs go down. Um, so first party cookie, this is where uh, there's a lot of activity. I mentioned earlier, where a lot of entrepreneurial companies are investing in publisher side first party data for targeting. So the idea here, and I have it on the next slide, is the publisher is, uh, it determines the users in a segment. They're young male interested in cars and makes that data available to the buy side 
without necessarily sinking cookies or sinking identity. Um, that's super interesting, um, but there's, there are lots of challenges. I'll go through this on the next slide. Um, and then IP address. So um, IP address works great at the household level. Um, you know, one thing I know probably some of us who are married may have seen is you start seeing ads for what your spouse is looking at online. That's probably because they're profiling your IP address as opposed to your cookie uh, and you live together on the same Wi-Fi router. Uh, that, that's a business idea, you know, a his and hers Wi-Fi router. Maybe it's a, someone wants to invest in that. Uh, but, um, but that's generally why that's happening. So overall, the picture on third party data is it's challenged with the ID reductions and Platforms need to support multiple methods, be it graphs, IDs, uh, potentially publisher data. Um, so uh, I wanna walk through this first party data example. Um, so first party data, when we're talking about first party data, we're talking about publisher data. Uh, obviously buyers have first party data as well, but we're talking about media use cases. So the idea here is that a publisher's first party data is being used by a buyer uh, as a form of identity. Um, so what could happen here, going from left to right, is you're on a publisher site, uh, maybe you log in or maybe you logged in previously, and the publisher is able to set a first party cookie um, that identifies you and your user profile, and they can uh, augment that profile with lots of other data uh, on the site. They could also use the behavior on the site to segment. So a user who goes to the auto page seven times might be interested in cars, that kind of thing. Publisher has a profile, maybe they're using a DMP, maybe they're using some other form of, uh, form of aggregation. And so the publisher is now going to take that data they have about the user and pass it through to the programmatic value uh, chain through the exchange to the DSP. Uh, and they're gonna pass it either as segments of users or as deal IDs of, of users, so the DSP can target them. Uh, and I'm not gonna name names, but there's like four different vendors I know of who are, doing, who are trying to do this in various forms. Um, and it should, in theory, be quite useful because publishers understand their audiences quite well. Um, so the pr challenge here is how, if you're a buyer, how do you trust or verify the data? I mean, if it was up to publishers, every single user would be a high value young user interested in buying lots of stuff. Uh, so how, how are we going to standardize taxonomies, audit, verify, understand that data? Also, how are we going to move from deal IDs? So deal IDs have become kind of the, uh, the, um, the whitewash on all of ad tech's problems. If you have a problem, just put in a deal ID and it solves it. And that's really not the most effective way to be using this sort of data. So um, how do we use segments or other identifiers that are separate from deal IDs to execute this kind of thing? Those are challenges out there. But I, I'm very convinced that publisher data, first party data is gonna be a big part of how targeting will work in the post identity world. Um, finally, uh, talking about attribution. So attribution is the art of separating causation and correlation, uh, understanding whether the ads actually work. It's always been flawed. It's always been difficult in digital. We've, uh, I'm not the first or the last person to talk about how last click is uh, a terrible way of, of attributing your inventory. Um, but um, in, in a world where attribution is dependent on identity and identity is challenged, it's gonna get worse. So anything we thought we knew about attribution is gonna get worse. Um, and so, um, once again, we can go through the various forms of identity and say, third party cookies, great. They work, but they're going away, great. Probabilistic graphs. So typically the conventional wisdom is that probabilistic graphs aren't used for attribution because they're probabilistic. So you have sort of an error rate built in and you don't want to uh, evaluate your dollar spent in a world where there's potentially some, you know, some variation of accuracy. Um, that, that may be different. Individual buyers may have a different point of view. Um, deterministic graphs, uh, where we know who the user really is by email address or phone, they're great for, uh, for attribution, but scale is an issue. So the data has to be extrapolated to a larger population. You may only be able to do that on a very small portion of your media buy. Um, first party cookies, very hard to work for attribution because they're first party to the publisher, not to the advertiser. Attribution would require the same first party and by definition, that would be third party. Um, so there may be solutions that are probabilistic here, but it doesn't work very well. Um, IP address, you know, it works at the household level again, um, but it doesn't account for mobile and Wi-Fi. It can be quite difficult. Um, so this is a very challenging area. I think attribution is probably the area where we have the most question marks on how do we evolve given, uh, given 
the um, uh, loss of identity. And so like you can imagine, this isn't real data, this is just an example data to get you thinking, is uh, you know, what would a media delivery report of the future look like? And it might be that uh, we start thinking about media uh, and attribution in terms of very distinct types of identity and then have some sort of statistical model to try to make sense out of it. So in this example, maybe you have um, you know, 29% is ID from graph. So that means that we have a deterministic graph from a vendor that purports that 29% of the people who are exposed to the ad are, are really well known. We know who they are. Um, and therefore we can do what we would consider accurate attribution, uh, deterministic attribution on them. But then you, the rest of the, of the, of the um, uh, media plan or media delivery was on a mixture of programmatic guaranteed ad, uh, inventory with no ID and contextual ads with no ID. So how do you take the ID, the attribution from the known users and attribute it to the unknown users? Maybe you use some of these sandbox technologies, which I said I wasn't going to talk about, but for the sake here. Um, and it's going to be very messy. So what I think is going to happen is that you'll end up with a mixture of methods, including using deterministic graphs, but also considering older methods, the ones that were traditionally used on TV and print, like zip code, postal code holdouts, or time-based blackouts, where you drop all ads for a week and see what happens. Um, and I think this is a big opportunity for both advertisers and vendors to invest in uh, hybrid attribution systems that aren't exclusively deterministic. So uh, I'm going to summarize. So now it's a good time to start your, entering your questions in the Q&A section that Paul will be going through. I, only, I see there are three questions, but there's got to be more considering the depth of stuff I've been talking about. Um, so what are the key themes? Well, identity is dissipating and digital media is in jeopardy. The way we've done stuff is not going to work moving forward. Um, and that's a really big change. Um, and it also is going to vary quite a bit by the media. Um, and that is going to turn into complexity. Um, there are many forms of identity as I've kind of beaten that horse to death in this conversation, but none of them solve all of the use cases. So uh, platforms need to flexibly and intelligently use those forms of identity in different use cases. So when you're looking at a platform that you want to use for advertising, you should be asking these questions, uh, which is how are you using different forms of identity? If I am a customer of uh, some other vendor, like uh, a identity vendor, how can I use that data? Where will it work when it won't work? What are the impacts of privacy regulations, et cetera? Uh, and then this is sort of my motto in business, which is one size does not fit all. Um, throwing all your money at one vendor and hoping it all works uh, without asking these questions is not a recipe for success. Um, so with that, I think we're going to open up the Q&A uh, and yeah. Paul will be moderating that. So uh, what do you got, Paul? All right. Well, first, I have a product name for the his and hers Wi-Fi that you, you came up with. I yeah. can't take credit for this. I'm not going to call out the person. Because who knows? But uh, wife fi Wi-Fi. <laughs> so that's uh, that's great. Uh, anyway, um, so we have a few questions. Um, first, I'm going to go in you know, order of when they were sub submitted. Uh, oh, so some reactions to wife fi uh, It's uh, it's very gendered. It could yeah. There's there's not. It is. Maybe we don't spouse fi but that doesn't really roll off the tongue. Anyway, first question. <laughs> Uh, what's an example of a site with shared identity consortia that carries ads? Um, so uh, shared identity consortia. So this is where you you have common logins of multiple sites. Um, I think uh, so. This being a European centric presentation, my understanding is that a lot of the big German uh, sites have shared logins. Uh, so Axel Springer and. Uh, the other the other big ones but I, i'm i'm not 100 percent positive i haven't personally worked on that um i think the news corp sites though uh are are sharing some data between them i'm not sure if they have a shared login yet um but i i think that's where a lot of publishers are starting to uh think when they uh, especially when they operate multiple sites with different brand names yeah and our own katie jones uh who uh who's commercial director in the UK chimes in to say local examples would include the European Net ID Foundation in Germany or you can consider publisher alliances such as the Ozone Project is offering this so thank you Katie thank you Katie. color all right now uh, to the next question in your view Ari is there a 
retained from offline channels point, point of view role for panels. Didn't Nielsen DAR still calibrate versus a panel even with the FB graph to resolve against? Yeah, that's a great question, Tom. Um, so um, yeah, so I think there absolutely is a revived interest in panels. Um, the, the history on panels, uh, Comscore, Nielsen, uh, you know, et cetera, is um, that they were pretty effective at measuring digital uh, exposure to different audiences when the digital campaigns were large enough. Uh, so in the pre-programmatic era where you're running sort of a multiple site uh, IO based campaign, uh, panels could work uh, even if they were expensive or had measurement, you know, imprecision. Um, and then they became less and less useful as buying fragmented with programmatic. So buying a thousand sites became a lot harder to measure than buying, you know, 20 sites because panels naturally have a fall off in coverage as it gets a smaller and smaller site. Um, so, so that's why panels sort of declined in, in interest in the programmatic era. Um, so I don't think that's changed, but I think what has changed is that for those big campaigns now, panels might be the best solution you have if you want to measure the reach demographics or psychographics. Um, and I expect them to become more important to those kind of campaigns. Um, as to the question of DAR, yes. So the, the, the way DAR was originally built, and I'm the patent holder on it, but I have been a little bit out of the loop, so I'm not sure how this has changed. What well, they would take data from, let's say, Facebook that had accurate demographics, and they would do um, a comparison against the Nielsen panel, which also had very accurate demographics, but on a smaller set, and they would adjust it. Because even though Facebook has very accurate demographics, there are biases in that data. For example, people lie about their age when they're under 18 and not allowed to use Facebook. So the average the average 16-year-old on Facebook is actually 13, and the average 18-year-old is actually 16. Uh, so those are kind of things that uh, having a panel are very useful for. Okay, uh, we had a question come in through chat that I'll jump to. What is the impact of Google and the other platforms who have consistent ID and wide reach to the rest of the ecosystem, including publishers? Will they invite publishers in or keep that ID to themselves? Yeah, that's a really good question and we don't know yet. Um, so to start with, let's, uh, there's a misconception about the Google Chrome announcement that Google will be unaffected. That uh, the Google ID, because they have Gmail and other logged in sites, will allow their entire ad stack to continue to use the ID and that is not accurate. Um, so the Google ID is still a third party ID on your site. Um, and even though Google has Google Analytics, which uses a first party cookie on your site, it still is not, that ID cannot be used across sites. So Google has, has the same limitations as anyone else in terms of how the browsers will treat their identity. However, they have the advantage of being able to leverage their login, for example, onto many sites. So what Google could do, and I don't believe that they've, they've announced they would do this, what they could do is aggressively ask their publisher partners to request that people use the Google login as a monetization vehicle um, and thereby spread their first party ID across many, many sites. Um, so that would be the way they would, they would do it. And to my knowledge, um, that they have not done that. I think that would be, um, you know, very touchy on the uh, anti-competitive side. Interesting. Uh, next question. Where do you feel second party data sits within all this, especially given how easily it can be commoditized these days? Well, second party data uh, generally refers to publisher data, which I've actually in this presentation been, re been referring to as first party data. So apologies for the confusion. But when I'm talking about a publisher collecting data and then making it available to an advertiser, that that is second party data. And I think I kind of covered that pretty thoroughly here, which is I think it's really important. Uh, I think it's going to be a big part of how publishers are going to react to the lack of identity. Uh, but it has limitations, severe limitations, because it's very difficult to use across sites. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. How long do you think it will take for a critical mass of brands to revise their expectations on user level targeting and really responsive conversion attribution? Right, the brand, that's always a really good question. Uh, so how long, so the question is like, this, what I've been talking about is reality, but how, what will be the effect on perception? Uh, and so um, there is a complex interplay between agencies and brands where they both are supporting each other's delusions about the future. 
uh, because it's a lot easier than facing the truth. Uh, and I think this, this is the evidence for this. It's not just my opinion. The evidence for this is how many current, how many brands currently just don't advertise on Safari at all. Right. So Safari is 40% of audience and person for person, more wealthy, more urban, more desirable consumers. And yet, because ad tech doesn't work on Safari, the brands don't advertise there. Um, and so this is, this is an analogy for what I think the future holds around these more complex issues. Um, so I, I don't have a really good prediction. I hope it will happen in the next 12 months and we won't wait until the deadline when Chrome fully pulls the cookies to make these changes. Uh, and I think it'll be, uh, it'll be beneficial for more forward-looking advertisers to do this in advance. Interesting. Sort of a related question about looking forward, you know, and, and, and how much can we achieve here? Uh, looking forward to 18 months, how much change do you believe the industry will have been able to achieve in this area? And what is your best guess as to what changes will be implemented and adopted at scale? Right. So um, I think that there's this two year time frame that Google has provided, which is very fuzzy. It could be longer, it could be shorter. Uh, and um, and you, you start starting, you have to start imagining what precipitating events during that two-year period would be uh, notable such that they might get headlines to get people thinking as opposed to just sitting quietly for two years. Uh, and for me, the two events that we're waiting for are first Apple's announcement about IDFA. Um, so if Apple were to announce that they were deprecating IDFA, that would be a big wake-up call uh, because it would immediately affect a large portion of media spend. Uh, and secondly, Chrome's announcement that they're making progress on the sandbox. Uh, so Chrome announced the sandbox, which is effectively vaporware, doesn't exist, it's good ideas. Um, if there were some progress on that, if they announced a case study, if they announced a milestone, that would also get people thinking that this whole thing was a lot more serious and people might take to other modes of uh, identity. There's also another factor, which is looking at vendors. So people like LiveRamp, they're making big investments in identity, or really they're an identity company, but making big investments in first party deterministic identity. And to the extent that major vendors or smaller vendors have concrete actionable milestones that are useful to agencies and marketers, I think that will help move, move the needle. All right, going straight down the line. How can advertisers build a strong identity resolution strategy moving forward with the fragmented solutions that are out there? Right. Um, so I think I kind of made this point in the presentation, which is there isn't going to be one size fits all. So it is going to be fragmented and advertisers have to accept fragmentation. Um, I think that it's a, it's a matter of un starting with understanding. So for, uh, for a, the marketing department, uh, the CMO at the advertiser to start saying, well, digital is, is where consumers are, but it's fragmented and I have to accept that. Um, and it's not going to be, I'm, uh, I'm going to take on a single vendor that solves all my problems. I'm going to take on a vendor that does the best given the circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, and, then, and then sort of taking a point of view on things. So to give one example of a point of view, well, there are advertisers for whom incrementality is the most important thing. Um, so they spend a lot of money cross channel. They are very direct response oriented. And so understanding the incremental value of a given dollar in advertising is the goal. And there are, and the sort of techniques and data you need to try to drive that is one set of vendors and techniques. Whereas a different advertiser for whom brand and reach is the goal, uh, they may lean into panels quite a bit. And they may say, the CMO at a purely brand oriented advertiser might say, well, I need to strengthen my relationship with my panel of choice, right? So let's go deep on that. Whereas someone who's really into incrementality might be saying, well, I need to get um, a CDP vendor in here, a consumer data platform, and I need to choose a DSP that works closely with that vendor, and I need to get all my raw data because I need to re measure incrementality however I can. So those are very different kind of vendor decisions, mm -hmm. and I think the CMOs should think about how they relate to their business. All right, still quite a few questions, so I'll just roll through them. Sure. Uh, and we'll, we'll keep answering until, until we can't anymore. Uh, we're, where do you think the responsibility lies with devising identity and attribution solutions going forward? Browsers, DSPs, SSPs, third parties, or agencies? Well, I, I, you know, I, I, don't think, I don't think of it in terms of responsibilities. I think of it in terms of, um, of how do you get the best results for your customers in each of those segments. Um, I think that, you know, in, a, in an ideal world, the browsers would be providing a solution to identity, but in fact, they're 
providing solutions that stop resolution of identity. Uh, so they, yeah. so that gives you an example of why uh, the it's a sort of a loaded question. Um, I think that um, for it, it, it sort of varies with the business model. So if you're Google, you think it's your responsibility and you're trying to build it in your entire stack such that you lock people in and they only and customers only use the end to end marketing and business stack with Google. That's their strategy. Uh, and they're going to continue doing that strategy and no one should expect otherwise. Um, if you're an independent DSP, like speaking for myself as the CEO of Beeswax, we're saying to ourselves, well, we're, we're not in a position to establish identity, but we are in a position to give our customers as many tools as they want to do the things that we're talking about in this presentation. Uh, so we want to have the most integrations and the most flexible data policies and the most uh, you know, interesting, you know, technology for using it. Um, and that, so that's just not, once again, not a beeswax commercial. It's just to show the, the different business models that may exist depending on your position in the marketplace. Yeah, interesting. Can there exist an identity solution that eliminates all the cons you've mentioned and be a single solution for the industry? Or will the industry be forced to support multiple identity solutions? Yeah, uh, I don't think it's, it's feasible practically to have a single identity solution. Um, it, it is feasible technically, of course. I mean, basically uh, all the browsers can require a login and then use it persistently and pass it to everyone. That would be the ideal solution, but that's not gonna happen. Um, so it is technically possible, but it's un, it is uh, in practical terms, absolutely not going to happen. There won't be a single identity across the ecosystem. Right, you probably don't want any one entity having so much power over the entire ecosystem anyway. That's kind of what got us in this mess. <laughs> Next question. Would attribution be possible if manufacturers designed a unique ID per customer, although Apple would probably shy away? Could this affect the cost of hardware in exchange for passing targeting data to the ad ecosystem? Right. So uh, once again, anything's technically possible. Sure, you could get $10 off your iPhone if you opt in to passing your ID to everybody. Uh, practically, it's very unlikely in the Western markets that you're going to be able to compensate a you know, a phone or, or a device in the hundreds or thousands of dollars against the amount of value an individual's identity is worth in the tens of dollars a month or less. Um, so uh, it seems pretty unlikely. In the histor historically, um, there have been many, many startups that have uh, tried to trade off privacy for rewards or benefits, um, all advantage for those of you who are old enough to remember in the 90s. Uh, they tend not to work because the value exchange is too small for the customer and for the consumer, and also because um, they have a perverse incentive of attracting the least valuable consumers who are the ones who want those rewards. How does that work with TV? Uh, uh, CTV seems like a really interesting place for identity, and you know, all these smart TVs essentially come with software installed to track everything you're doing and what you're watching. So, has has that is that an example of reducing the hardware costs in addition for giving up some privacy, even though consumers probably aren't really aware of that? Yeah, you know, that is a good counterexample. So, the TVs uh, are subsidized with the data with the data dollars. I don't really know uh, the um, I don't really know the details on how the economics for a company that uh, is selling that TV data work. They mm -hmm. obviously are making some money on the data um, and TV being the most valuable media on a, like a per minute viewed basis um, certainly would be the area where you might be able to get that. But cons as you mentioned, consumers are not aware of that. I, I don't think consumers are choosing, you know, right. the more expensive privacy safe TV. <laughs> <laughs> over the less expensive. It's more like a tragedy of the commons problem where no one even knows it's happening. Yeah. Okay. That was my, that was my personal question. So I'll go back to the, no, it was a good one. The uh, will there be a reduction in audiences available to buy or just a reduction in the quality slash reliability of that audience data? Both. Um, so I, I think that <laughs> the major data exchanges are entirely dependent currently on cookies and mobile IDs. Um, and so the whole ecosystem where data is flowing from publishers to data exchanges to DSPs is going to be highly disruptive by the lack of identity. Um, and when you think about publisher first party data as one of the replacements for it, it's, it's very unlikely that an individual publisher's first party data is going to have enough scale to uh, reproduce all the millions of minute categories currently available on the data exchange you're much more likely to have very coarse 
categories of age and gender and income and things like that. In the current data exchange world, you have, you know, like pet food and tenders and things along those lines, which are going to be very difficult to reproduce in the future. So I think they'll, the, the amount of third party data available will be reduced by scale and scope. All right, the next one in, in order of time received. Uh, what's beeswax's solution to the cookie apocalypse? <laughs> uh, um, well, An anonymous so, attendee asked this one, it says, so. I'm not gonna go into a beeswax sales pitch, but um, in the written uh, white paper that we're forwarding around, um, it has the same content as this presentation, but also talks specifically about beeswax's solution. Um, let's just say we've been investing pretty heavily in some of the more flexible parts of what I've talked about. So being able to fall back between kinds of identity in different form. Um, so so uh, I think we have a lot to say about this subject. Great. And just a reminder, everyone uh, who's registered for this will receive an email in the next few hours. Uh, give us a little time to, to get it going with a link to download this white paper that he re referred to. So we have uh, four more questions and seven minutes left. So we do have time for a couple okay. others if we do a little lightning round. So submit your questions now. Uh, I'm going to cut it off at a certain point. Uh, next question. Do you really believe the Google programmatic stack won't access the info of a logged in Chrome user to uniquely identify the user after the third party cookie deprecation? Um, yes, I, I really believe that. I don't think that Google will use the Chrome login uh, for ad identification. I think that would be crossing a big line in terms of the tying between the browser and the ad team. I think the, I think a customer, I think a customer, a user um, voluntarily logging in on a given publisher site and having that publisher enabled to use that identity in their DFP instance would be much closer to kosher and would be much more likely to be the strategy moving forward. Okay. Do you think that contextual data, quote, making content king again, end quote, can be used as a proxy for audience data in cookie-less world, in a cookie -less Yeah, world? so the contextual data is, is really useful, but also really limited. And I think I talked about this in the last cookie webinar, but basically there's a bunch of problems with contextual data. The first one is that it is reach. So uh, contextual content only has a small portion of all content. A lot of content that consumers spend time with has no context. Music, social, gaming, none of those has any context. Um, there's nothing useful to know about a given site if someone's playing a game on it. Um, the second problem is that a lot of context is bad context. And this has been in the news quite a bit. Um, but if you go to news sites and you're browsing the latest news, a lot of it is bad news. And advertisers don't necessarily want that. As to the third, the kind of the third sort of question embedded in that question, like can you use context to infer demographics? Um, yeah, it probably works to some extent um, in that you know sports probably index higher for males, but not always, uh, and uh, and other sort of things like that. Um, but you know when you get to that point, you're probably better off doing it by site anyway. So media con media correlates with audience as well. A given site may attract overwhelmingly male whether or not they're interested in a topic that is considered particularly male. Um, so, so those are kind of some of the considerations. I'm generally a believer context is great, but is by no means a, a panacea or a solution to all problems. Okay, we got four more questions. So we're in the lightning round here. One, one minute per answer. What are your views on using hashed email IDs or federated IDs? Consumers can share their preferences and opt out. Yeah, so um, I was kind of putting this under the umbrella of deterministic data sets. So the deterministic vendors like LiveRamp, they currently use hashed emails or hashed phones to create their graphs. And what they're attempting to do is to now remove the linkages of that graph, the third party cookies and replace it with first party cookies. So it, to the extent they can do that, I'm, uh, you know, I'm bullish on that. I, I like the idea that uh, you could take a deterministic graph, let the user um, provide their email voluntarily, let the user opt out universally. That's all great. Um, I, I think that even if it's hugely successful though, it's not gonna be the majority of, all, of impressions in the media supported way. Okay, how do you see identity evolving in CTV? Um, CTV is really tough because it's multiple layers. It's the television manufacturer, the device manufacturer, the app, uh, and the and the exchange, and they're all sort of fighting among themselves for who gets to determine ID and who gets to see the IDs. Unfortunately, I personally think that we're going to move towards some more walled gardens in connected TV. Uh, they may not be Google and Facebook; they may be different ones. 
Uh, but uh, I think that identity is so important in TV that um, some of the bigger companies involved in the space are likely to hold it for themselves and to make it less available on a programmatic basis. Okay. Do you think identity solutions will pass government scrutiny and regulation, CCPA slash GDPR? Yeah, really good question. Um, so it's probably outside of my uh, legal understanding, like the deterministic ID question two questions ago about using emails and hashing and encrypting them. It seems like a very privacy safe thing, but I know the uh, privacy advocates think it's the worst idea ever. Um, so there's a real question about where it'll end up. I mean, you should never underestimate how zealous the privacy advocates are about any sort of form of marketing being illegal. So uh, whatever it is, whatever solution we offer, it's going to be, um, tr there's going to be an attempt to stop it by the privacy people. Mm -hmm. And uh, our little last question we have time for, uh, do you see DMPs having a role to play or are they in trouble? DMP, so I wrote, I wrote the DMPs were dead uh, a couple months ago and I got a lot of hate mail for that. Uh, I'd like to clarify. Uh, so DMPs, which are primarily anonymous ID based, are effectively dead and useless for the buy side. Uh, there's just, if third party cookies are going away and DMPs are primarily a way to match first and third party cookies, they don't add any value to buyers moving forward. Um, however, they've become more important on the sell side. So all the things we're talking about, about publishers using their IDs in more useful space, useful ways has to be enabled by a technology vendor uh, that you can call it what you want to call it, but it's basically a DMP. So first party data DMP becomes more valuable. Third party data DMP is totally useless. All right. Well, that just about does it. Uh, thank you, Ari, for sitting with us for this hour and walking us through this. Like we said before, we'll send out a recording link in addition to a link where you can download the white paper that lays out these solutions in some more detail does get a bit into what beeswax solution to the identity challenge is. So I hope everyone out there is staying safe, staying, staying distant, um, and taking care of themselves. And uh, we will be back with another webinar like this before you know it. So please stay tuned. And thank you guys so much. Thanks, everybody.